Hi everyone. Um, hopefully this presentation will go along smooth, like smoothly. Um, I'm sure it won't be flowing as quite as nicely as it is with you guys here to help prompt some discussion questions. But I just wanted to make sure that I went through a few things for you um, just to kind of grasp some of the major concepts between some of the artworks. I think what I will do is I will sep separately record 107 and then 108 in the study guides today for you. And then that's what we'll focus on for this week. Um, you, of course, have your readings and your additional videos to help you as well. Um, and then more than likely, we'll, we'll try to figure out a way of doing a test that's um, going to help you prepare for the AP exam. As of right now, there really isn't anything about extensions or whatnot, so I don't want you planning for that or be it being canceled since all of you signed up for that test. So I want to make sure that I prepare you as properly as possible, um, testing your materials, but also, you know, obviously at home, you know, maybe we'll have to be using some notes, but I don't want you relying on your notes so much, so I'll try to figure out the best way to test your knowledge on those. So today, we're going to be really focusing, focusing on um, how expressionism conveys the human psyche and see some of the inner turmoil of many of the artists that we look at today. So once again with the theme, formalism versus expressionism, um, yesterday or the last time we met, we discussed a lot of the formalist artists and seeing how they were organizing brushstroke and organizing color and organizing composition. Now we're going to go back and seesaw to the expressionists, people who would be maybe the followers of people like Vincent van Gogh, and see how they convey their inner emotions through their artworks. So the first artist we have is not in the 250, and this is James Enzor. Um, his parents were mask makers, and so you see a lot of masks um, in his artworks. And so when you look at his paintings, think about the ways that he creates and conveys emotion. Obviously, one is that inclusion of masks, right? So they have this kind of strange, sort of surreal kind of feeling to them. But think about how he's applying paint. Think about how he's applying color and how all of these things create and convey emotion. Um, he's not modeling smoothly. It's almost like he's scratching the paint across the surface of the canvas. And there's this you know, very deliberate mark making and texture and it's, the color is kind of acidic. So you know, he's looking at brushwork, he's looking at color, and then of course the strangeness of the mask give it very unsettling sort of feel to them. Here's one of his larger works that's at the Getty in LA. You can see all of this whole city coming out to kind of celebrate. This is more of an example of his still life work. And you can see that he was political as well, and so he made some political images, um, very much like Daumier, um, making critiques of um, modern society of the day. Um, you might go back to that first one and look at maybe what he's trying to convey through masks, like why are people wearing masks? How does this relate to modern society? Many of these artists um, were trying to ex escape you know, modern society. So this idea that people are fake or they're not really who they um, seem to be might be conveyed through the idea of a mask. Here's a, a lovely portrait of him. You can find him with his very fanciful hat um, there in the upper right corner. More still life. Okay. So the first artist that we have that's in the 250 is Edvard Munch and you look at Munch's work you'll see that very much like other artists of the day his work feels very impressionist so when you look at these two works think about how they are representative of the impressionist that we looked at with the image on the left that scene kind of has a snapshot sort of quality. So it's kind of looking at contemporary life. And then the artwork on the, the right, so I apologize if I said left or right improperly. The image on the right 
is a view of modern society. Um, you can see, you know, the umbrellas. You know, it's possible he knew of Kabbalet's work um, with that repetition of the umbrellas as you go from image to image to image. But also the uh, the de bleh, excuse me the brushwork, the dots of color, the light and atmosphere of daily um, life. So once again, capturing moments of time. When you look at the dance, um, you might want to think about how he's trying to convey emotion. There's some great resources for this one online if you're really interested in it. You might notice that the woman on the left and the woman on the right, and supposedly the woman in the center, is probably exactly the same person. You might want to think about how she has changed through her love with this very skeleton-like man. It kind of feels like he's a corpse, doesn't he? So what does the love do to oneself? And Enzor had a lot of hardship early in his life. If you go back again to Sick Child, um, his, I believe his mother and his sister both had turbo tuberculosis and died when he was relatively young. And so the concept of a sick bed and sickness is evident in his work. He gained a lot of fame from it and it's a reoccurring theme throughout his career. So that leads us to the scream by Edward Munch. And so when we look at it, um, what you want to do is closely look at the painting, thinking about your content and your function. What is the mood that's being conveyed? And what are the multiple ways in which Munch achieves this mood? So paying really close to the visual evidence in the painting. Right? So his mood is very terrified, disturbed, and a bit isolated. And then if you look at the imagery, it's very abstract, it's stylized. This is not a realistic depiction of a person. It almost feels like they're an alien person with a swirly kind of curvy body. Um, some art historians have said that he was interested in Peruvian masks as well as um, South, South American uh, mummies. And so it kind of recalls that kind of corpse-like creature as well. You'll notice that there's a blood red sky that's swirling, very similar to Van Gogh's work. We see that long, visible brush stroke, bright color, that exaggerated perspective. Look at that bridge that he's on. Notice how it's severely angled to create kind of this disturbing fig, um, angle. And then we have these two ominous figures off to the to the left side in the distance and we don't know who they are so are they coming to get this man are they coming um, to disturb his peace um, what is their role in the painting so the scream was an image that Munch explored in many different ways he painted it several times as well as made a series of prints of it so here you can see some variations in it The red sky was something that is reoccurring in the works of Munch. And when Munch was painting a series, um, this one is um, painted at a similar time as the scream, um, Krakatoa volcano in Indonesia was erupting. And it erupted so much that it really did change some of the weather patterns. There was a lot of ash in the, in the breezes, and it made its way all the way up into northern Europe where Munch was from. And so it is quite possible that at sunset and sunrise, the sky looked like it was inflamed. And he said that it felt like the sky was screaming at him. If you look at the art history or the smart history and you look at the reading, you'll notice that he wrote about this, that um, he was very much inspired by a walk and seeing this blood red sky and felt like he was screaming from the inside. Um, also, like many artists of the day, he was very much in interested in the artworks that came from colonialism. Um, the Peruvian mummy that I mentioned before, looking at abstraction that could be seen in um, indigenous America or African art. And so you'll notice the 
oversimplification of some of these figures. Think about some of these faces kind of looking like some of the masks that we saw, especially from Africa. Here's an adolescent girl, once again, possibly from a sick bed. Here's a dying mother. And so he made a lot of fame from these very sort of um, depressing scenes. Um, and so that's where Monk um, really made his career. The next artist that we have is Gustav Klimt. And so this is a kind of a unique um, image. Um, many of us see it. It's recorded over and over again. You go to a gift shop. Um, people buy calendars of it, but I don't really think everyone always really understands the content of it. It's maybe not as romantic as it may seem. So the question that I have for you guys is, is this painting sweet or sour? So what we'll do is we'll do a discussion question on this tomorrow. And what I want you to do is to find some visual evidence that is in this painting that discusses if it's love or if it's something other than love. And so you're gonna to wanna to look at some of that visual evidence throughout the painting to decide if it's sweet or if it's sour. So sweet is being sweet and sentimental and loving. Sour is that it's maybe the opposite of what we just said. Feel free to watch. You know what? Let's go ahead and watch it together. We're in the Belvedere in Vienna and we're looking at Gustav Klimt's The Kiss from 1908, probably the most famous Klimt. And actually I have to admit that I had forgotten that the painting was almost a perfect square because I've seen it in so many posters where it's been cut down and made into a rectangle. It's a very large painting and there's so much gold that it's hard not to think of a religious icon. And I think in some ways Klimt was trying to create a modern icon something that suggested a sense of transcendence. Well, there's no question that the gold here makes you think of the Byzantine tradition, maybe some of the tile work at Ravenna. There is the way that patterning, especially around the faces, becomes a kind of halo as well. You have Klimt building up the gold. He's got those gold circles. They actually rise off the surface of the canvas. And catch the light, much the way that the gold was tooled in medieval paintings. There is the sense of the male figure of patterns that are so rectilinear in contrast to the curvilinear, to the circles and the ovals that we see in the female form. But the point that you made about the sense of the spiritual is so powerful in this painting. I think we forget that that darker gold ground seems so much as if the figures are somehow being dissipated into the cosmos, that they are so lost in the intensity, the eternity of that kiss and all removed from the everyday world. I mean, we have to remember that this is a time of incredible modernization in Vienna. The city of Vienna has been transformed in the previous 30 years into a modern city. Here, Klimt is abstracting a universal experience from the trauma, the difficulties, the anxieties of everyday life. I think it's also important to see this in relationship to Klimt's Beethoven freeze, where the figures confront evil forces, these mythic figures, and in the end there's this embrace, this kiss, this emergence from evil into fulfillment and perfection. A minute ago we were looking at the painting by Egan Schiele called The Embrace, but there there was so much more of a sense of the physicality of the bodies, the way that the bodies really aren't present here and are cloaked in these decorative forms reminds us how much Klimt, although he was exploring this kind of sensuality, was also disguising it or covering it with a kind of decorative patterning. And that's absolutely right, with the exception of the faces. And here, this is where the entire painting changes. The female figure is completely full frontal but horizontal, so that there's this beautiful sense of her passivity receiving that kiss, but also a kind of deep interior feeling with her eyes closed, her fingers just delicately 
touching his as he holds her head and his neck reaches out and around and you get a sense of his physical power through the strength of that neck but also the intensity of his desire and of course they're both crowned on his head you can see a wreath of leaves on hers almost as if they were the stars of the heavens. Sheila gives us an image of a couple that's electrified by kinds of agitated outlines. Sheila is showing us a kind of truth through the energy of the moment, whereas Klimt seems to be reaching out to a truth that is for all time, that is so aestheticized, it feels as if it has a degree of absolute permanence. So when you're looking at this painting, um, you might want to focus on how it's innovative for the day. How is this different than many of the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist works that we've seen? One of the things that really jumps out for, to you is probably the patterning on his clothes, as well as her clothes, as well as in the hillside that they're on. You'll notice that his is very geometric, where hers is much more circular and organic. Um, in the video, they mentioned that idea of it being spiritual. Maybe the use of gold is representative of um, Byzantine church decoration. And then thinking about the colors and the embrace of the two of them in their emotion. I don't want to get too much into this because I do want to use it for the discussion question. But please make sure that you really look at their pose and really look at the location that they're at. Um, why are they on the edge of a cliff? You know, why are they embraced this way? Why are they posed the way they are posed? You can see that he repeats a lot of the same sort of characteristics, outlined figures, use of gold. Um, lots of times people kind of sleeping or in slumber and like why? Here you'll notice that there's a bunch of different people from different age groups. So we've got we, like Augans, we have a baby, we have a youth, we have a young woman, we have an old woman, we have a man, and then of course this on this figure off to the left of this death sort of figure. We're not going to watch this video, but there is a good video on Smart History if you're interested in watching it. Klimt was very much known as a portrait painter, and he did a lot of image from Vienna society. So these are a lot of social lights, and he would use his very unique style of kind of that flat sort of patterning to show off a lot of the furniture or clothing that they were wearing. And you maybe have seen the movie or read the book Lady in Gold. Um, this is um, one of his models that he had several paintings, Adele Block Blauer, and so she um, was sent to concentration camps and her family it has been in pursuit of many of these paintings for several years. Um, they were in the National Museum in Vienna and I think they finally had to give up this painting that we have here on the right um, to her family probably within the last two years. So that ends the discussion for 107.